Welcome, we'll get started in just a few moments. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today for our talk with Elon Green in conversation with Michael Bronski about the new book, Last Call, A True Story of Love, Lust, and Murder in Queer New York. I'm Kristen Motti, an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library Central Library. Before Elon joins us for a reading, and um, just a few housekeeping items and an introduction, a brief introduction to Elon and Michael. Your microphones and cameras are on mute. Closed captioning is available today um, and can be turned on or off with the live transcript CC button on your screen. If you have any questions for Elon at any time during the program, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to those toward the end of our hour together. Um, we'll get to as many of those as possible, but if any questions come up, please just go ahead and type them in as you're thinking of them. Signed copies of Last Call are available from our bookselling partner, um, Trident Booksellers in the Back Bay section of Boston near the library. Um, and they will ship nationwide with free media mail shipping and we have signed copies. So if you'd like to buy a copy from Trident, the information is on your screen. We'll also put it in the chat box during the program. Um, also, please check your local public library if you'd like to buy a copy and I'll put um, Boston Public Library's holdings in there as well. Now just a little bit about today's author and moderator. Elon Green is a writer and editor whose work has appeared in publications such as The New Yorker and The Atlantic. He is currently an editor at Longform. Last Call, which has been recognized by numerous reviewers, is his first book. Moderator Michael Brodsky has been involved in social justice movements since the 1960s. Currently he is a professor at Harvard University. His latest book is A Queer History of the United States for Young People. Now, let's welcome Elon. Elon, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, I think we're kicking things off. Uh, I'm reading a little bit from the book and it's the first time I've read from the book. So that's exciting for me. It's uh, a couple of pages from the Boston chapter, and it's about the life of uh, Tom Mulcahy, uh, who was the second victim. And it's a little bit about that, as well as uh, gay life in Boston in the 50s. Tom is not remembered in great detail by most of his classmates except to say they liked him. He made an impression on William Michael Bulger, who commuted to Boston College High School each day from a third floor apartment in South Boston. The seeds of the politician he became are evident in his yearbook entry. Bulger classmates wrote, always manages to come out with a quip, which never fails to bring a laugh from the class and teachers alike. While sitting for their school photos, most of the boys seemed to look at a spot just over the photographer's shoulder. Bulger, however, cocked his head ever so slightly and looked directly at the camera. Bulger and his wife, Mary, rented a home near the Mulcahy's during the late 1960s in Mashpee on Cape Cod. He'd been a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives for nearly a decade, while his brother, James Whitey Bulger, was the Boston mob's towering figure. I think of Tom very favorably. He was a good person, said Bulger in October 2018, just over a week before his brother was fatally beaten in prison. You'll never hear anyone say otherwise. That was the consensus. Tom wasn't aloof or a loner. He was a sweet kid, but indifferent to sports and extracurriculars, which is primarily how friendships were formed. His yearbook entry was tongue in cheek. Every morning enjoys baseball, football, and swimming, lists Latin as favorite subject. It's unlikely that any of this was true. When the, class when the day's classes ended, 
Tom went straight home. None of his classmates suspected Tom was gay. They wouldn't have understood what that meant, they say, for there simply was no awareness of homosexuality on campus. Every now and then, somebody would seem to be, I don't know, sissified, says Bulger. You'd be conscious of that, but I don't think you made a further conclusion about it. The subject of homosexuality wasn't engaged with in the classroom either. To the extent priests broached it at all, they did so just to forestall discussion. Nor would the children have learned about queer life at home from either parents or local periodicals. To be gay or lesbian in Mattapan, West Roxbury and Roslindale was a lonely experience. Bereft of bars and clubs, one had to travel seven or eight miles to Bay Village and Beacon Hill for the Napoleon Club, Playland, Punch Bowl, or Jacques. Out of desperation, even the bathrooms of the city subway system were a destination. Until the mid 1960s, the public toilets were a hot spot for subway Sammies, who, upon entering a restroom, would place a nickel on a shelf by the door to signal their availability as a sex partner. Such measures were necessary. Not even private parties offered protection. In March 1945, Police raided a house party in Back Bay. It was fairly raucous. People were just dancing and mingling and kissing and so forth, an attendee reported. A plainclothes policeman had infiltrated the party and a couple of dozen rev revelers were escorted to the Charles Street Jail. There was a trial during which the accused were found guilty on morals charges and outed. As a result, the city's gay men curtailed house parties. No place was truly safe. Instead of being a refuge, Boston's gay bars and clubs were raided by the police with regularity. There was no expectation of privacy. The Midtown Journal, a South End tabloid published by a straight man named Frederick Shibley, recorded the arrests. Butch balls baffle bulls, went one headline, for transgressions as minimal as kissing. Shibley, it should be noted, was an equal opportunity antagonist. The Boston Catholic Church tried unsuccessfully to shut the paper down. Midtown Journal's habit of printing the names of arrested queer people was pernicious. In 1953, 19-year-old George Mansour went to a party in Bay Village. At the moment it was raided by the police, he was administering oral sex to a sailor. Mansour became an influential film programmer, had known he was gay since his early teens. When he decided he'd quote, rather eat dick than mashed potatoes and lost weight. An error riddled account of the party ran in Shibley's scandal sheet. Mansoor, a high school valedictorian, was accepted at Boston University upon realizing the incoming student had been convicted on a morals charge. The university revoked his acceptance. Back to you, Michael. Hi, Elon. Now we're all set here. All um, right. So um, I, the book is incredible. I was incredibly moved. It is so well researched and so completely gripping. It's just amazing, right? Um, but I, I had I was wondering uh, when um, when did you first hear hear of this case and what drew you to it? I mean, I kind of remember reading about it when it was happening, but um, I was in my fifties at that point. Um, why, of all the stories out there, why, why did you pick this one? Uh, well, I heard about it in uh, 2016, uh, just reading an old issue of The Advocate. And, you know, I think the, certainly the initial interest was, you know, basically the sordid details mm -hmm. of the murders, but that was only for about five minutes. Uh, what got me intrigued beyond that uh, was when I started to read about the lives of the men uh, who were killed. And of course, there was very little of that in the press, but it was enough to pique my interest. And as for why that, as opposed to anything else, I don't know. Uh, you know, I just felt that there was far more to the story than could be uh, fit into a, you know, a single feature. Sure, sure. And, and of course, alas, there are so many horrible stories about violence to gay people and queer people 
you had a, a wide way range to choose from. I mean, what 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 I found so fascinating about the book, um, because the murder story is we we like know what it is. We've actually seen the TV movie <laughs> of serial murderers, right? But you have such incredible reporting here, right, about these men's lives, their environments, their childhoods, and the and also what amazed me was the the reporting about the police work, right? And I'm just curious did, because I've done some reporting in my own life and in, in the past. Um, did you find that people were willing to talk to you about this? I mean, the men's families, um, and what was that process like to talk to you know to talk to wives and children of these men? Um, well, the men's families, you know, that was the most difficult um, uh, for the most part. Uh, they were not willing to talk uh, for, for understandable reasons. Um, but everybody else, including friends, uh, you know, co you know, co-workers, uh, they tended to be willing to talk. And I think it was really because nobody had ever asked them to. Mm -hmm. And they all had stories to tell. And, you know, I made it very clear up front that I wasn't digging for dirt. I had no interest in writing something that would, you know, um, needlessly tarnish their reputations. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to give people a sense of who they were as people. Okay. Was that true of both the, the, the gay friends as well as the straight friends of these men? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The, their willingness to participate was, you know, I would say about equal. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, when, when I could find, you know, people to talk to, uh, they tended to be, uh, you know, missed and, and loved equally by, by queer and straight people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, because I can certainly understand, right, that, that gay people m may want the story to be told to expose the background to expose their 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 friends tragedy um but i could also see that other people may may want to see it as more private yes but what 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 really surprised me in the book um because i know when if you ask people who don't get asked to speak they're usually happy to because somebody's listening to them right is that the police were so forthcoming in so many ways you had so many wonderful details about the policemen and about their investigative methods and about the people doing autopsies how was that to do so this was a case where i think my uh being straight was probably helpful to this book mm -hmm. um i think that you know friends and family members and detectives were equally willing to talk to me um, the, the, because the detectives, I think, you know, couldn't look at me and say, oh, this guy has an agenda, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, it, it, and they, they couldn't say, you know, uh, he's gay, so, you know, he, he, he's gonna think that we screwed up the investigation. Right. And, um, and so I think that it probably in general, made people more likely to talk to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were there any issues about confidentiality with the police or about um, uh, investigations that could, could not or should not have been made public or were they just opening up everything to you? Because you have a no. lot of detail. <laughs> no, they, <laughs> they were really open with me. And I think that is mostly because, you know, to them, uh, this had a successful resolution. You know, the case was solved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they were proud of it. Um, you know, some more than others. Uh, but because of that, I think they felt that now was the time to be candid. And, and, and they were. They, there were no questions I asked them that they didn't answer, you know, as long as they felt they could. Right. There were points during the book when I really felt like it was sort of an episode of Law and Order but from the other side, from the people interviewing the police, not from the police telling their own stories. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I talked to them quite a lot, but it wasn't generally because I wanted their perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, it was because they always knew a great deal about the victims. And so they were a very good source for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
well, and of course, they wanted you to have whatever their perspectives were. It's just that you didn't actually need them for the story. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, I was very sparing with it. But, you know, if, 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 if them talking about their role in the investigation for uh, a couple of hours is what I needed to get biographical information, then I was certainly willing to do it. Right, right. So the other thing that I was thinking about during the book was that um, the, the uh, I'm trying to think of how to say this uh, most effectively, that the, the AIDS epidemic, right, cast an entire pall of, over the entire story. I mean, not just the extra layer of death, right? But it changed how the gay male community thought, how they acted, um, how they acted in different ways in different places, right? The gay community in like the townhouse was different than the gay community that was downtown <laughs> and certainly different than the community that was in New Hope <laughs> or in like other places. Um, so what do you think of the effect of that AIDS had on these men's lives? Because so many, not, several of them were closeted, they were married, they were um, on the down low, I guess you would say. Um, and, and what do you think the effect had upon the killer's life? So I can't so much speak to the effect that I think it had on, on the killer's life, although I'm guessing Right. Probably not that much different from the victims. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that AIDS just added an extra layer of uh, vulnerability and uh, just terror mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to everyday life. And, um, and, you know, in the case of the victims, it left them open to predation. Uh, you know, in, in the case of the murderer, you know, probably left him open a predation too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that the, um, I don't want to give, I don't have any spoilers, but we do find out that the killer is actually related to a medical field. Feel free to spoil it. <laughs> um, his name's Richard. Uh, the, uh, um, I mean, I'm just, I was just reading the book, right? I was just wondering what the, given he was in a hospital, given that AIDS in, in the you know AIDS begins in 1981. By the 90s, there's still no real medication, and people are dying all over the place. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if you had any sense of what that felt like for him as a medical professional. No, no. Um, the one time when he uh, actually spoke out was during a trial uh, mm -hmm. in 1990. It's the one time I really have a sense of his his voice and. The, um, the, plaintiff, uh, the plaintiff in the trial discusses AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, but, but uh, Richard doesn't discuss it at all. At all, uh -huh. so the absence speaks louder than anything he may have said as well. I think so, because quite a lot of that trial you know, was about AIDS. Right, right. So that was a perfect segue to my next two questions which is how do you think that the HIV AIDS epidemic affected the news coverage of all of this? And how did it impact the police investigation, if at all? I don't think that it overtly or explicitly affected either the news coverage or the investigation, but I do think that there was just this structural uh, mm -hmm. effect on it, maybe in ways I just, couldn't really point to because I think AIDS was so pervasive that it affected every, to the, you know, the, it was so pervasive it affected everything. Right. There's, there's just no way that it didn't affect both media coverage and, and, and the police investigation and whatever that effect was, it was negative. Right. Right. So, I mean, I was the other thing, I mean, connected to AIDS and separate from it, of course, because it's far more um, it, before AIDS ever happened, right? Was that homophobia, right? Teaches, uh, touches everybody's lives. It touches queer people's lives. It touches their families' lives. It touches straight people's lives. It touches the lives of people who do homophobic things, right? I mean, it's sort of a, a common mistake to say that it only affects gay people. Um, but did you think that homophobia at all affected the police work in these cases or the reporting in the papers? I mean, I know that sounds sort of repetitive, but I think it's sort of a separate question. Yeah. I'm not even sure if it's a separate question because, you know, the, the newspaper coverage was dependent on what largely what the 
police were saying to the reporters. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I do think that, that, that it affected the investigation. Uh, I think it almost certainly infected the NYPD investigation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure to a certain extent, although a lesser extent, it affected uh, the New Jersey side of, of the investigation. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I think part of it is that, uh, you know, when, when somebody is murdered, I'm guessing that ordinarily a certain amount of generosity is extended to that person by the people investigating the case. And it just wouldn't surprise me if there was, you know, a lesser amount of generosity extended mm -hmm. to these mm -hmm. men. Right. I mean, I think, I mean, having, having sort of lived through all that time up, although from up in Boston, right. Um, it struck me um, that the, that the story that the book and the narrative of the book, right. Fits in so neatly, right. With what we were seeing on the TV at the time, whether it be law and order, whether it be other movies, I'm thinking of, you know, earlier, right. With the movie cruising. Um, so do you, do you think, or it's a two-part question. Do you do you think that that the general cultural scope that was happening at the time um, affected how people understood the people, both in the media, the police, the common person reading it, understood the story? And did you rely on any of that in sort of sketching out the backgrounds for these? Because you really do have you have great scenes in the townhouse and in these other bars, right? Yeah, well, the answer to the second question is is no. I, I, I don't think uh, I don't think I took in a single piece of pop culture mm -hmm. when I was writing this, with the exception of watching Black Mass to get a, a quick uh, cliff notes on uh, Whitey Bulger. Uh huh. Um, but you know, I, I of course popular culture influenced how people thought of of queer people and and gay men. I mean, how could it not? Um, you know, I, I can't remember who said it years ago, but but uh, an actor once said that, you know, look, if you want to credit, uh, uh, you know, the popularity of, of Jennifer Aniston's haircut on on Friends, then you've also got to credit a lot of the negative stuff from pop culture on, on how it influences people too. Hmm. And I think that's absolutely true. I think people are are influenced in in ways that they don't even realize. And I think that's always been true. Right. Um, so when, when you were writing the book, um, so first of all, how, how long did it take you to write the book? Well, as far as the writing of, of the book itself, about a year and a half, but that was preceded by about a year and a half of uh, work on the proposal and on uh, just getting a sense of the entire scope of the story. Uh, you know, I interviewed about 45 people. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, and as you were writing it, did, um, and sitting with these men's lives for, you know, for over three years and maybe even longer in terms of when you first began to think about it and everything, um, what was that like to be sitting with these stories? Because you have, I mean, you just go into such depth into each of these men's lives. It, it's almost like a novel and it must've been very odd to be writing about real people and sitting with them in your head. You know, I don't even know how I would describe it. It, mm -hmm. was, I, it was something that I knew I had to do and I had chosen that way to tell their stories. And it was always, it was never unpleasant, even when I was describing things that were, were horrible, uh, because I always felt that, you know, there was just something um, important about telling the scope of their, their stories. Mm -hmm. And, and it was, a, so it was, a, it was a gratifying thing to do to find out, you know, the banalities of their lives and, uh, mm -hmm you know, things that they love to do and hobbies and uh, just, you know, insignificant little memories of, you know, 50, 60 year old memories from, from uh, people they'd gone to high school with or just new in passing. 
And, you know, I loved, I loved that challenge. With most of us, right, we, we all are intrigued or repelled or obsessed with, uh, you know, murders, serial murders. Um, and, you know, we can either shut off the TV or we can actually put down the newspaper and you actually decided to follow through more and more of this. But I'm not so interested in so much what it felt like, but um, how do you sort of see yourself as a journalist doing this? Yeah, because the book isn't, I mean, the book is about a, a series of murders. It's a true crime thriller. It's also a, um, a story about aspects of gay male life and socializing for over a decade. Uh, and a story of actually these gay men's lives over many decades, as you just read from, from Tom Mul Mulcahy's life, right? And it's sort of an incredible sketch of these, you know, um, people growing up all over the country I never, I never saw it as true crime, and I, I still don't. Um, primarily, I saw it as a work of history, and the, you know, the the crimes and the subsequent investigations was just a means to write that history. But, you know, secondarily, I saw it as little bio, you know, biographies, chapter long biographies of, of these lives. And then the third thing that I saw it as, and this was not what I had originally envisioned, but it came about, was the opportunity to write about queer life in places where that work hadn't really been done. <clears throat> you know, um, Young Youngstown, Ohio is probably the best example. Because to my knowledge, uh, you know, according to historians I talked to uh, from there, no one had ever written about queer life in Youngstown, Ohio. And, you know, that's, it's a little preposterous given how vibrant it was and how important Youngstown was for, for so long. Right. I think that, and, and for me as a person who's written about queer life and queer history over the years, um, and I, I guess teaches it as well, right? That that your your investigations into Youngstown, into uh, Michael, who grew up in was it is out west somewhere? It was Michael grew up in Youngstown. Oh, up in Young in Youngstown, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess he was visiting somewhere further out west for a while. Um, was, was just this sort of invaluable look at these towns, right? Because they're. There are in recently, right, a, a bunch of oral history projects have actually cropped up in small LGBT hits, uh, historical centers, but no one's really brought this together or or, or um, brought it up in such a way that actually makes it such a compelling story that's so broad too. Well, I felt that I felt that in order to know who these men were, you had to know where they came from and certainly what sort of environment they were living in. Um, you know, I think it mattered that Tom grew up in neighborhoods where, you know, nobody was talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, it mattered that, you know, when, when Michael grew up, um, it was still an oppressive environment, but there were bars, there were a lot of gay bars around. And, um, you know, it's the same with looking at, you know, at Peter's life and to the extent that I could Anthony's. The, um, I mean, in, in so many ways, right, the, the book is a sort of, I mean, the sort of thrilling thing about serial killers that we, we follow the serial killers and that, that their victims actually become incidental often, right? Like, we know all about Ted Bundy, but we actually hardly know about any of the women. <laughs> right. Yeah, we know about the Boston Strangler, Anthony Salvio, right, but we um, really don't know about the victims at all. Um, so that uh, I, I love the quote in the beginning from your grandmother uh, telling you to be remembering people who were lost, right? Um, which actually struck me, I'm not making any comparisons, but struck me very much um, as in the shadow of sort of Holocaust studies. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that if you're, if you have the opportunity to tell a story that, you know, hasn't been told and, and will, almost certainly not be told if you don't tell it now, uh, then what are you even doing? It's, uh, 
why bother, why bother being a journalist? Had you ever thought of any of these small, any, well, any of smaller parts of the story as being magazine articles? Because I know you've done a lot of magazine work. Um, not from anything that went in the book, but um, I had written uh, an entire, most, most of a chapter uh, for the proposal that was about a bar rag that I mentioned in the book called HX. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's kind of publication where if you were gay and living in New York uh, in the in the 90s, then that was how you knew what was going on at any gay bar or club in the city. And it was very important to, um, to people socialize. And, uh, you know, I couldn't fit that into the book. And it, it's always struck me as something that might be worth doing uh, separately. Um, so um, looking at the book, since it's not a crime, crime thriller, <laughs> looking at the book as a work of, of literature, do you, do you see it? And I'm, I'm not making up larger aspirations or smaller aspirations for I write. How, how, how do you, how did it feel to write the book and how do you see it fitting into the larger literary scope? Because it's, it's so well-written. It really is, is a literary book more like Truman Capote's in, in Cold Blood or something, right? I don't, I don't know how it fits in or where it fits in because I feel like it could be any of, it could be siloed into, you know, three or four different places, whether, whether it be uh, his, history or, you know, uh, uh, New York history, queer history, you know, true crime, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, queer studies. I mean, who, who knows? Um, and it wasn't, it definitely wasn't something that was on my mind when I was writing it, uh, because all I wanted to do was to tell the story. And as, as for what I ended up with, let the chips fall where they may. So, so we're getting a couple of questions coming into the chat, but I have a few more for you because we have plenty of time here. Um, I want to do a little bit of a, of a deep dive in some of your research. And I just want, since I'm in, well, you're in, not in Boston, but I am in the library is in Boston, right? Um, and you just read the Boston chapter. What, what was it like doing the research in Boston about the, in the 50s, the late 40s, the 50s of, of um, Tom's growing up and looking into the queer community in Boston at, at that time. What, I mean, I'm interested both in how, why, how, how did you go about it, but also um, how did it feel going about it to be uncovering this, which nobody, people have written about it, of course, there's a Boston history project, but there's not. Uh, well, I talked to scholars from, from the Boston history project and they mm -hmm. were invaluable uh, as was the book that they wrote, Improper Bostonians. Um, but it was definitely the, the history side of that chapter was frustrating because there is very little else that's been published outside of improper Bostonians, uh, which is why I went right to the scholars to, to see what else they to see what else they had. Um, you know, and then uh, as far as writing about Tom's life there, uh, luckily, Boston uh, College High School was really shockingly cooperative with me and you know sent me sent me a yearbook put me in touch with people uh you know i think i talked to seven or eight of his classmates um i mean it's amazing that that many of them re were even still alive to, to to talk to right and um you know everybody everybody was 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 really cooperative um but yeah i mean as far as 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 the queer history aspect of that chapter that was that was pretty rough because you know so so much of it was just never written down and is probably gone for good right and i just want to add for people who don't know boston college high school is connected to boston college which is a jesuit school and i believe they still ban an lgbt group on on campus <laughs> oh I, i'd be surprised i'd be surprised if it were any other way yes and um you know my understanding is that uh Boston College itself is not much more accepting. No, I, I believe that is 
I believe they're accepting in the under the constraints of what they feel is morally acceptable. Yes, that's right. Which is not accepting particularly. <laughs> right. Um, so let, let's go to some of the questions. There are a few here now. Um, uh, somebody's written in, um, I'm trying to adjust my eyes to the chat. Um, how, uh, how, how did you organize, excuse me, I'm gonna put my glasses on to read it completely and not take guesses at words. Um, how, how did you organize or code your research? How could you find exactly the right quote or reporting to create different particular scenes? Well, it, that's sort of backwards. Uh, the research and the reporting and the interviews dictated what I wrote. So it wasn't really a question of filling in the blanks. It right. was, this is what I have, so this is what I'm gonna write. Right. And, and, um, what, and what's that process like then? Since you obviously have some goal in mind of what you wanna end up with, even though everything be, may, may be changing. Well, you know, so I, I'd, I'd start writing, you know, using what I had, but then of course, you know, when you get to holes in your thinking and holes in your research, then you have to find the right person to talk to. And, you know, just to give an example, when I started writing about um, Michael's life in New York and I got to the part about him being a typesetter at the New York Law Journal, I realized I didn't know anything about what it meant to be a typesetter at the New York Law Journal in 1990. Mm -hmm. Or 91. And um, so I found this guy, Frank Romano, who had been uh, a consultant on the Steven Spielberg movie, The Post. Uh, and um, he spent an hour or two with me walking me through, you know, what the day to day would have been like, mm -hmm. you know, and that's it's just a paragraph in the book, but I, I think it was necessary. Right. I, uh, that question was from Dawn, who also had asked, um, uh, for the horrible true crime elements, how did you balance your approach between what you knew in research and the way these, these presented it in detail within the writing? Which struck me is that, I mean, we're dealing with a book in which people are horribly murdered, dismembered, put in garbage bags by the side of the road, and yet you do it very very tastefully <laughs> so no element of being exploitative about it um i never when i was working on the book I, I never thought about the audience in general but i did think about the victims families and friends and how they would react to everything and so when i was you know in those sections in particular where uh their bodies are being found and the damage that was done to their bodies was being described. Uh, with every sentence, I thought, okay, does this need to be here? And is it getting across what I wanted to get across, which was to just to show the damage that had been done. Um, so I never wanted to be gratuitous. And, you know, I, I do, I'm not somebody who believes that just because I know it, the reader deserves to know it. Uh, whether that's about the damage done to their bodies or, you know, aspects of their lives. Uh, every sentence is a choice. Right. I, I, the, I mean, because I was struck so much by reading it that, that um, how much, I'm trying to think of how to say this the correct way, how much of the book felt... Um, so deeply respectful of, and, and in many ways almost sacred about these these men's lives, as though you were you were memorializing them, um, and that they had accidentally all been brought together by these terrible circumstances. Well, I mean, I I was, and you know, I knew that this was the one shot that was going to be had to to tell the story of who they were, and I mean, I guess you know. <laughs> It's, I suppose it's strange to say, but, you know, I, the more you learn about people, the more, the fonder you get of them and the, the more protective you are of, of the stories. And so I wanted to be fair and, and, you know, I, I, you know, I was always very conscious of the fact they're not here to dispute things. And, um, 
that was always on my mind. Right. Um, I, I knew you said earlier that that it was harder for you and for them of talking to the, the men's families. Um, I was curious if you've kept in touch with any of the people that you've interviewed. Yes. Um, you know, in part because I just like talking to them, but but also, you know, you talk to people for three years, you don't just turn off the spigot, but but also, you know, whenever there's been developments with the book and book related projects, uh, they deserve to know. And um, were they pleased about the book? I mean, not pleased with it, but pleased about it. Sure. Um, and then were they pleased with it, I guess is my follow up question. As far as I know, I mean, you know, I, I, I gave them, you know, early copies because I, I didn't want them to be blindsided by anything. And, you know, I think they felt that it was, you know, it was never going to be something that was enjoyable, but, you know, the story was told the way they felt it should be. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a question from um, John that's sort of a tech, uh, technical publishing question. Was it your decision not to have photographs in the book? Or were there no photographs available or? Well, so yes and no. Um, I wanted to have photographs of each of the victims. But um, when you have photographs in a book, there's, you have to get permission and um, uh, to, to reprint photos. And you either have to find uh, the photographer uh, who took the photos or barring that you've got to get permission from the families. And because uh, I never could find uh, Anthony's family, I decided I wasn't going to have any photos because I didn't want to have photos of some and not others. Uh, you know, uh, Anthony had sort of been neglected while he was alive and during the investigation in his death, and I didn't want to be doing that in the book. Right, and I've certainly read, I just read a book about two weeks ago that was had probably about 12 photographs, none of which were particularly useful for the book, and they clearly couldn't find the right photographs or get permission for them. Yeah. And it felt, you know, it, it felt actually injurious to the book rather than helpful in any possible way. Um, so uh, um, uh, Charles asked, uh, mentioning the chapter about HX, were there, could you talk about any of the other materials you found that were not included for any number of reasons? Nothing actually comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, you know, there, there were certainly like a lot of things that, you know, were in certain scenes that didn't make it because, you know, you only have a limited space to tell a story, but as sort of big topics uh, or, or entire scenes, I, I don't think anything was, was, was really taken out. I mean, I would say a, more often than not, the work I did is in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, so a, a, another question from Dawn Abbas, and we've talked about this before, but I think there's more to go into here. Um, how did you gain the support from the families when, when you were speaking with them? Well, I mean, you, there must be a, there must be a great deal of trust building going on. I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't conscious. Um, it's not as if I didn't talk to people who declined to talk to me. Um, you know, I, I think part of it is I was so upfront about not wanting to tarnish their memories and mm -hmm. not digging for dirt. And, you know, it was always one of the first things I said when I called people and I, you know, cause I called a lot of people out of the blue. Um, that's my preferred method rather than email or letters. Just like to get them on the phone because that's the, 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 the quicker they can get a sense of who I am, then that's the, the quicker they can decide whether they want to talk to me. Um, you know, I, th I think in general, if, if people had a story to tell, then, then they were willing to talk to me. And if, if, if there was something uncomfortable about it, then they, then they weren't. Right. Um, 
as since the book has been out for a little while now, right? The pub date was a month ago or a few weeks ago. It was a month and a day. Month and a day. Not that we're counting. Um, uh, have you been pleased with the reception in the reviews? Yeah, I mean, how could I not be? Um, the authors can always not be happy with reviews, but you know, uh, I, I've been very happy, and and even uh, when people haven't liked it. Um, they generally don't like the things that I intentionally did. Mm -hmm. And so I can't really be upset about that. You know, um, you know, a, a number of people, uh, you know, sort of complain that the, there's no courtroom scene, you know, and there's that, not that, that final beat. And uh, well, I mean, that was by design. So it's okay with me. Right. I mean, that also, I think, is a result of too many people watching too much Law and Order with the courtroom scene as always the last eight minutes. Yeah, people have their expectations and, mm -hmm. and, and that's fine, but I'm not going to meet them. Right. Um, so now that now that you've written the book, it's come out, it's gotten great reviews. Um, are there any is there anything about about the book itself that you wish you had done differently or that you not regret doing, but that you've thought about it now because the publication process, right, is over a year by the time you finish it and then it goes through editing and it goes through everything else. Um, have you been thinking, have you thought more about the material in ways that you might change the book if you wrote it now? Well, I mean, I've thought about the material a lot. I never, I never stopped thinking about it. It wasn't one of those things where, okay, the book was done and I moved on because it was just such a pervasive, uh, part of my life and I, and I enjoyed having it be part of my life. Uh, but no, there's, there's nothing that I would have done differently. I had a, I had a long time to change things and, you know, sometimes I did. Um, but no, I'm, I, you know, and I may feel differently in 10 years, but right now I, I feel pretty good, happy with, with how it turned out. Right. And if what, what would you like to, this is the aspirational question. What, what would you like to, the book to do in the world? It's like an Oprah question, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just happy that it gets read. And I, you know, uh, I'm especially happy that it seems to be making the rounds among queer people uh, because to the extent that it was, you know, written with anybody, you know, to for, for anybody, um, you know, I couldn't have done the book without without queer people helping me at every level, both as sources, uh, uh, and readers, and you know, that's that's the whole book. I mean, and and the other thing too is that I, I very much wanted this book to not be my voice. Uh, I wanted the book to be driven by the voices of others, uh, particularly in a, in a chapter like the, uh, the chapter about the anti-violence project in New York. Um, I mean, I, I sort of felt like, okay, I'm sort of curating these stories, but these are not my stories. So how was writing the, I, I know that, I know the easy answer to this is going to be one's a magazine article and one's a book, <laughs> but how is, how, how was writing the book and bringing all these voices together and bringing them into a really, a, an incredible tapestry of, I mean, describing, uh, you know, decades long and very specific instances that happened during the murders. How was that different for you as a writer than writing shorter pieces? Um, it's really just about my attention span. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I write a feature, by the time I get to the end of the feature, I'm, I'm kind of done. Uh, but with this, I thought about it every day for three years. And I still think about it. Um, I think it's really just a matter of how much does this matter to me? And this mattered to me more than anything else I ever did. Right, and do you, do you think it'll affect the work that comes after this in terms of, of, of your emotional attachment to it? Yeah, well, 
I don't, I don't know how it'll affect my emotional attachment to, to work that comes after, but, but certainly the things that I, I learned uh, will, will carry over and, and already have, um, you know, because I had never written a book. And so I was learning to do that on the fly. And, uh, you know, if I ever do it again, uh, hopefully I'll make fewer mistakes. Right. Or at least not the same mistakes anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's more likely. Not the same mistakes. Not the same mistakes. Um, so were there any responses to the book that felt uh, either from individual people or from the, pe the families or from friends that had uh, extra meaning for you or deeper meaning than others? I mean, it's great to get a New York Times review for anything. And it's great that it was a rave. Yeah. Um, yeah, Michael... Michael's sister said something like she felt that I had sort of given him like an afterlife. And what more could you want than, than that kind of response? Um, you know, pe people that I wrote about in the book, uh, you know, were, were, were just were pleased and you know, th those are the people. <laughs> those are the those are the people whose whose verdicts uh, uh, I really care about. And um, yeah, so so far so far it's been very positive. Um, I don't I don't have any sense uh, uh, how how else it's been um, greeted by by victims' families, but. Um, if, if, if they don't, if they don't like it, uh, they haven't told me. It's quite, quite possible they don't. You know, this was, um, despite my intentions, I'm reopening a lot of old wounds for these families. And, and that's, you know, that's sort of like a best case scenario. Um, you know, I, I may see their, their murders, uh, as, as part of a, a, a larger project, but that's not how they see it. And, and that's understandable. It's their lives. Great. As um, thinking about the future, what do you think that you'll be doing next? Any more books knew. coming up? I wish I knew. Uh, I'd love to have another book idea, but I don't. And, uh, you know, if my, if I, when I do my, my agent will be the first to know. Um, and I, I, we still have more time if people want to put in some more questions here. Um, but is, is there anything else that you want to say about the book now? Um, We've actually covered a lot, but we do have about five more minutes. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, um, if you do buy the book or, or get it from your library, uh, I do hope people pay attention to a chapter about a man named uh, Fred Spencer, uh, who was uh, uh, another murder victim, but not in New York. And um, I have a particular attachment to that chapter because his was a story that really had never been told. And, um, and, uh, you know, I talked to classmates and uh, uh, a girlfriend and a uh, family member and uh, his story, uh, people tend to leave it out even when they're asking me about the book. And uh, so I do feel that uh, I really ought to mention Fred. And um, could you sketch that story out briefly for, without spoilers? <laughs> yeah. So a sense uh, of why it's so meaningful to you. So Fred was a, a graduate student uh, at the University of Maine uh, who was murdered. And, um, and there was no justice done uh, in his case. And, you know, I think like anything else, when you're writing about something where uh, the information available is, is scant and you sort of have to create history from the ground up and create, you know, the story of a life from the ground up, you know, that's, so that means more to me than, than, you know, something where there's a lot of existing material. 
uh, in the public record. Uh, there was very little here. And so uh, that, that just meant talking to a lot more people um, to, to get a sense of his life, uh, especially since it was also just uh, relative to the other men, it was, it was very brief. Uh, you know, he was in his early 20s when he was murdered. And it's, in a way, it's a much greater challenge to write about a young person who's been killed than somebody who's middle-aged. Right. I think that um, we, we touched upon this just somewhat earlier um, about writing queer history or writing. But one thing I say in my book, Queer History of the United States, is that is that queer history doesn't exist. It's just American history. That's and right. That's right. Out the details, right? And I thought what was so amazing about the book, right, was that it's not a, it's not a gay murder story. It's not a serial killer story, right? It's actually it's actually an incredible sl uh, series of slices of, of American history. Yeah, that you bring together so beautifully through through sort of a queer lens. Yeah, it's really just it's just a, 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 a lens through which to view history. Yeah, and you know, it, it, the the focus may be on queer people, but yeah, that's right. There is no queer history. There's just history. It's just history, right? And and you've done it beautifully in the book. Thank you. So, I, I want to thank you for the book. I want to thank you for the interview. Um, I think we're going to wrap up in a minute and Kristen has a few things to say at the end. Um, but I want to urge everybody to um, get the book from their library or even better buy it. <laughs> as an author, I, I'm in favor of people going to the library and of uh, buying the book as well. Um, so, but thank you very much. It's a wonderful book. Everybody should read it. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible book tapestry of these men's lives and of the times in which they lived and the terrible things that had happened to them. Um, Kristen, did you want to come back on here? Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Elon. Thank you for the conversation. Um, I just want to say, I haven't read the whole book, but the chapters I've picked up and read have been, have just kept me engaged and it's really a fabulous read. So please mm -hmm. do pick it up either at the bookstore or at the library. Um, I want to also thank audience members who ask questions. We, it really enhances the conversation. Um, you may be interested in some upcoming author talks and other programs that we have. Um, we will, you can find out more at bpl.org and we'll have that right here in the chat for you. We have many programs for people of all ages. And so I just want to thank Alan Green Michael Bronski, and I want to thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. We will have the video available afterwards if you'd like to rewatch it or share it. Um, be well, take care, and good afternoon. <laughs>